Okay, so we're going to talk about input and output. Input and output are important for any cyber physical systems because we will need to um, interact with the physical world through uh, these input and output mechanisms. From the textbook, uh, you can find relevant materials in chapter 10. The first set of slides are based on chapter 10. I also have another set of uh, slides that will give you a little bit more information on the interfaces and buses. So those will be a separate set of slides I will present later today. I may not be able to finish all the, the second set. Um, and then after that, tomorrow, I will talk about I square C. So as we mentioned earlier, cyber physical system is to connect a um, cyber world with the physical world. And uh, a lot of the times, especially in physical world, you don't have everything in digital, digital um, signal format. Uh, many physical systems are um, continuous uh, as opposed to the digital um, values that we see in cyber systems, in, in cyber uh, space. Also, physical processes are continuous in time, whereas uh, in cyber space, uh, in a computing domain, uh, oftentimes we, we use discrete uh, events or signals in time. And the way we program our cyber system, uh, most of the time is to use sequential format or um, programs. So the programs you write, it has an entry point and uh, it goes on uh, by following the execution path. Uh, execution flow of your program um, mandated by the algorithm you implement using any language that you choose to use. Whereas the physical world, uh, oftentimes you see uh, things happen at the same time. Um, and um, so that's what we consider concurrent. So really you can see from this uh, slide, there are semantic um, mismatches between the cyber world and the physical world. One side is digital, the other side is continuum. Uh, one side is discrete, the other one is continuous. And the software execution is sequential most of the time. And uh, the physical process is concurrent. So we need to have ways to connect these analog and digital worlds. There are many practical issues that we need to resolve in the actual system design. Analog versus digital is the first thing that we uh, have talked about um, from previous weeks. How do we convert analog signals into digital values that a cyberspace um, components can process? Also, there are connections through wired uh, so that we can transfer information but there are situations a wireless communication method will be preferred because the physical limitations, uh, the distance and the accessibility. Also, when we transfer information between these two worlds, uh, we need to consider whether we want to use serial fashion or parallel fashion. Both have its advantages and disadvantages. And for events, uh, we would like to determine whether we want to do sample or uh, triggering. So sample, uh, for the case that the signals or changes are, are always important to know. Whereas events, on the other hand, are rare so that you don't want to spend um, your resource to entertain these events all the time. Also for data transfer, uh, we need to consider the speed of the transfer, uh, often described in bit rates. There are also other considerations uh, in terms of the security, authentication, and access control. When we get down to the system implementation, 
uh, depends on the um, size of the, uh, the PCB board or the uh, physical form factor, we need to consider the physical connectors. In some cases, uh, like in high power environment, bigger connectors are preferred. But if you are working with a very small form factor, small space, uh, you want to have your components tightly integrated on a small PCB board, you can only use uh, the small form factors ICs. So in that case, you will have totally different physical connectors. And related to that, uh, there are electrical requirements, uh, voltages and currents, uh, depends on what kind of signals you are gonna deal with you will decide what kind of voltages you can tolerate or support, and what will be the current um, be able to um, drive the components for being supported, um, allowed by the microcontrollers. So those are the practical issues that we have to resolve when we design a sample physical system. This is an example of microcomputer board this board has been very famous for quite a while. Uh, it's called a BeagleBone. And starting from the first generation, BeagleBone has many variants. This is one of them, BeagleBone Black. Uh, this is a little powerful microcomputer board. Uh, the processor is from Texas Instrument. Uh, on this board, uh, you can find um, many um, different um, um, input and output um, devices and uh, connections. So in the center, you can see we have a microprocessor. This is the uh, ARM-based uh, TI microprocessor. Uh, but around it, there are many different components. And first, that's uh, we need to have a power supply to this whole system. So you have a DC power. And uh, for connection with the other um, networks, you may use uh, the Ethernet uh, controller with the uh, controller chip here. And you can store uh, your um, data or uh, system um, information using this flash memory or the SD card here. Uh, it has a, a few USB interfaces. Um, one USB host, I believe on the other side, there's a USB client port. And also there's a DDR3 memory chip uh, that is important for the operating system to be executed. And also it has serial interface that runs RS-232 protocols. And this board has both analog and digital inputs and outputs. Um, so most of the uh, things we discussed earlier, those are uh, digital ports. Also, we are able to um, use some of the pins as analog ports for the inputs and outputs that we'll show um, in a few slides. For this kind of microcomputer board, um, BeagleBone Black has, uh, you know, a good community that people have been designing uh, so-called daughter board that can fit on the on this BeagleBone Black. And this kind of daughter board is called a cape. Like in this picture, this is a cape for BeagleBone Black. Uh, it's it could be much simpler uh, in this example because we don't see the the back of this board. But uh, the way this works with the Beagle One Black is you can use this um, um, pin connectors on both sides and just you know uh, fit in um, to these two rows of um, sockets on the top. And when you push this board onto this Beagle One Black, which serves as a baseboard, um, then you will be able to. Um, you will be able to uh, you know, have the function, have the circuitry connected to the baseboard. So whatever circuitry you, you put on this cape will now be able to talk to the microprocessor through these um, you know, 40 pins on, on each side.
And even more, you can have uh, the similar size of capeboard and you can um, design a small breadboard uh, as, you know, as a way to um, connect your other components to this bigger one black. Because when you plug in this cape to the bigger one black, all these ports become you know, hardwired to the individual pins. And with this breadboard here, now you can you know, try different, maybe seven segments, maybe buttons to interface uh, with the um, big open black uh, through these uh, two rows of connectors. In our lab development kit, we actually have a board like this uh, with breadboard and also um, two um, rows of connectors. And we're using Arduino and this type of add-on board or daughter board is called Shield uh, in the Arduino domain. So if you hear somebody you know, design a Arduino Shield, so you will know it's something like this, which can be plugged onto a Arduino board. Now for any type of embedded system board like uh, uh, blackboard like a uh, big open black um, you will be able to find out the pin assignments uh, on these uh, two uh, rows of connectors uh, one is called a p8 one is called a p9 and you can see that these um, so each row here uh, is a 40 23 on each column, so another 23. So total you have 46 pins uh, on each side. And uh, each of these pins are named differently based on their purpose and function. Uh, some of them, as you see the first few, are related to power. You have ground, you have VDD, and you have two types of VDDs, 3.3 volt and five volt and you have um, power button and reset button that you can trigger, um, reset. Beyond those power related uh, pins, you can find uh, GPIOs. GPIOs are the ones that you will find very useful for general purpose input and output. And for our lab, for example, you will use general purpose IO pins to control the, um, for example, uh, buttons. You can use um, these pins to connect buttons to. Although we're not using big one black, I'm just uh, using this as an example to explain how we generally use these GPIO pins. Other pins um, like uh, SPI. SPI is one of the serious um, protocols that we will talk about and you will have a few signals associated with SPI. And that's why uh, these pins are marked differently. Uh, they are not GPIO and they should be used for that specific protocol. On the connector P8, uh, you will find all of them are GPIO pins that you will uh, find very useful in your applications. Another note uh, that we have here, many of these GPIO pins can re be reconfigured. So for the microprocessors like this one from TI, the pins may have multiple functions. We can choose the functions of these pins by setting control registers inside the microcontroller. We're not gonna talk about uh, each of the individual um, control registers you need to operate, but the uh, takeaway message from this slide is that for all these, uh, for, for most of the GPL pins, uh, you, uh, you have the option to configure it differently. And what kind of functions you can configure otherwise, uh, those can be found through the data sheet. And in this example, many of these GPL pins can be reconfigured to uh, pulse width modulation output uh, to drive um, PWM devices or they can be uh, timers, uh, et cetera. On this slide, we wanna show you a few Arduino boards and compare 
than with other um, type of microcontroller based boards. Um, here we can see the Arduino Uno. This is one of the most popular Arduino boards. Um, it's slightly cheaper than the Mega, uh, which is on the right side here. This is the same one we use in our labs. Uh, that's included in the, in the lab development kit. Also, Arduino has a much smaller uh, boards called a Nano. Uh, so uh, there's even smaller number of pins that you can use. On this side, this is a series of board uh, from Node MCU. Um, like this one has a very good Wi-Fi um, you know, uh, SOC built in on this board. So you can use it as an IoT device. On the right side, this is the uh, explanation of the pins from the Arduino Mega 25, 2560. Um, you see that it has a lot more pins than Arduino Uno. And you'll find it, this is gonna be beneficial when you work on lab two and lab three. If you look at these pins that we listed here, um, these are digital pins, and on the left side, uh, we have analog pins. You can infer the functionality of these pins from the labels. So on this side, you have A0, A1. A stands for analog. And on this side, you don't see uh, A or D, but in fact, they are uh, digital outputs, inputs and outputs. And for the top few, uh, from pin 13 to um, two, these can also be configured as a, a PWM to drive any PWM devices. A few other pins, as you notice that they have specific labels, uh, like here, TX0, RX0. This TX and RX is uh, used in series transfer protocols, like RS232. TX stands for transmit, RX stands for receiving. So this pin will be sending bits out and this pin will be receiving bits into the microcontroller. Also, you notice that there's SDA, SCL. These two pins are used in I2C or inter-IC protocol, which we'll talk more next week. So when you work on the second lab, we will be using these two pins to connect to I2C devices, the um, accelerometer and gyro chip. This is another example uh, as part of the um, UC Berkeley's um, design project. They provide a um, a platform based on microblades core, uh, which is another type of microcontroller. And similar to many other microcontrollers, microblades core use memory mapped peripherals uh, inside the microcontroller. Memory map is a concept that refers to when you have a register or device or anything that you want to read and write, you assign a memory address to it. And for memory addresses, uh, you, uh, as a part of a memory address space, you can, you can have a large memory space to address many different resources. That's one of the um, benefits of memory mapped devices that you, is you can have a very uh, large range of space that you can refer to using an address or addresses. Um, this DIO158 uh, underscore out, uh, as it explained here, is a C preprocessor macro defined in a header file. What this really means is that in your C program, as long as you include that particular header file, which defines this DIO158 underscore out, this will be um, accessible in your C program as a uh, address. So even though you write this symbol in your C code, this is in fact gonna be uh, translated into a memory address that your program will access. 
and this address for this micro blade core uh, will be able to access these eight bits on that microcontroller. And for this eight bits, this is the this my Rio DIO you know fifteen to eight output state. So this is in fact the value that you will output through this port. So if you want to send any value through this port on the device, you essentially your program should write uh, any value to this address, which is represented using this symbol. Okay, you don't have to you know find out which header file. Um, the message here is, even though in many cases when you work with the registers. Um, depends on which microcontroller you use, this symbol, this name of the uh, register might be in fact mapped to a memory address. And this memory address is hidden in a header file that you don't normally see. You could find out the exact address by reading the data sheet, uh, but for programming purpose, uh, you may not have to find out the, the exact address. You can use these predefined symbols which represent the name of the resource. Next few slides uh, you've seen from our previous class. Uh, this is the GPIO design, uh, how the microcontrollers uh, use their pins to connect to the outside world. Most of the GPIO pins use open collector circuit as we shown here. So we have an NPN transistor uh, the base is connected to one of the register, actually the, one of the bits in the register that microcontroller will be able to control and write to. And the collector uh, pin of this will be connected to the physical pin, which in turn will be connected to a pull-up resistor to the VDD power supply. So with this open collector design, we will be able to uh, use this pin from the register internal to the controller to have impact on the output pins. And the benefit of doing this is that we can essentially isolate the internal circuitry with the outside circuitry. The same pin can be used for input, although the, um, the internal circuitry will be different, uh, even though the physical pin could be the same. And using such a design, you can have multiple users to connect the same pin on a bus. And um, the GPIO pins are typically configured and when you, you, before you use it. And when you configure them as output pins, any of the controller can pull the voltage down uh, so that will have impact on the bus. When we talk about the I2C, the inter-IC protocol, you will notice the effect of such a open collector design. And each microcontroller has its own current limit. So it's important that you have uh, current limiting resistors and you need to choose the proper value for these uh, current limiting resistors so that the current sink into the microcontroller will not exceed its own limit. We have done this calculation last time, so I'll just uh, skip this two slides. When you have microcontrollers and you want the microcontrollers to work with different components um, outside its own internal domain. So there are many situations you need to face, uh, you know, how we can transfer the data. We transfer the data using wires, and these wires can carry signals uh, to transfer control signal and the data signal. For the data signals, we have the options of using parallel data transfer or serial data transfer, or parallel versus serial data interconnection. For parallel data transfers, uh, we essentially have more than one wire uh, at the same time, and we transfer one bit per wire. So at any given cycle, you expect to um, send out or receive in multiple bits at a time. And that's why we call these type of uh, data interconnection as parallel. Um, 
the ATA, uh, uh, the storage um, standard, and the older PCIe standard or bus and SCSI, those are all parallel um, signals. On the other hand, if we use only one wire for data transfer, and of course we use one wire per direction, in this case, these type of transfers are serial transfers. A good representation of serial data transfer or serial data um, interconnect is RS-232. This is a protocol with a very long history. Uh, the benefit of using RS-232 is that you can transfer um, simple data over a long distance. Um, you will transfer one bit at a time. So if you want to transfer eight bits, um, a byte, you have, to, you have to transfer these individual bits one after another. Similar to RS-232, we have a few other serious serial transfer protocols. I2C or inter-IC protocol is the one we're gonna talk about next week. Also, we've been using a lot about the USB. We have USB 2, USB 3. Um, and also we have SATA or SATA, which is a um, you know, modern protocol for storage devices. We have a mixed um, data internet connect. PCIe is, we call it mixed because PCIe uh, has so-called multiple lanes and each lane is actually serial data transfer. So each lane is actually transfer one bit at a time. But for modern PCIe, PCI Express or PCIe buses, you expect to see multiple lanes it's common to see four lane, eight lane, 16 lane PCIe buses. So in that regard, we're transferring um, multiple um, bits at a time. But if you look at each individual lane, it's actually transferring um, one bit after another. So we've seen that um, parallel interconnects uh, being replaced with serial data interfaces. One of the reasons uh, is that um, if you have multiple connectors, you, you cannot have a long transfer distance or higher transfer rate because the uh, interference of these parallel uh, wires, they have to sit close to each other. Um, you have to deal with the crosstalk when you have such high number of parallel wires. And the other reason is for series or serial data interfaces uh, to becoming popular is because the, um, the clock that we can drive to pumping these bits is getting higher and higher. So traditionally you, can, you, you have to rely on multiple bits to transfer at a time. Now you can rely on higher clock speed to push the bits one after another. You can still achieve satisfactory throughput by using the serial digital interfaces. 